Hi guys, thanks a lot for joining us today. The purpose of this session is the VAT reverse charge, which I found in practice and in industry has often caused a bit of difficulty uh, for people trying to implement it correctly. Uh, good news is that actually it's really straightforward. Uh, it's often though your advisors can't make it straightforward. Uh, this is going to focus on the actual practicalities of it. So what do I look, look out for from invoices from overseas? Uh, what do AP have to look out for? Do AR have to do anything? What are the, uh, what are the debits and the credits? Uh, and what are the impacts for a partially exempt business? So really practical stuff, which hopefully once you read this session, you should be able to kind of at least take it, watch it again and flow through your own examples. Remember, it's really simple, the reverse charge. So if you're finding it difficult, you're probably doing it wrong or you don't understand it. So what are we going to specifically cover off today? In no particular order, what is the reverse charge? Uh, what even happens? Why do we do it? Uh, how do I determine if the reverse charge applies to an invoice I receive? This is a really good uh, kind of tradecraft skills for your eight guys on AP to learn. Uh, just what to look out for um, and how do you even know uh, if it needs to be applied? What are the accounting entries of the reverse charge? I'm putting this in here because uh, financial controllers and accountants want to know it and you often don't get it from tax advisors. They say you need to debit credit, you don't need to debit purchases, credit sales, uh, which is obviously no help at all because how do you actually do that on your accounting system? How do I charge myself VAT? You know, it's not as simple sometimes as what they just say uh, in advice papers. Uh, determining the VAT liability of SERP and services, this segues into uh, how do I determine if, the, if I should even do the reverse charge? So just very high level, how to determine what the VAT liability of services are from when they're purchased overseas. Uh, the VAT recovery uh, of the VAT reverse charge input VAT. So can I recover this VAT I'm charging myself? And uh, that has particular ramifications on partially exempt businesses. What should I do on my VAT return? So where does this fictional VAT which I charge myself. Where does that go? Uh, a few links on where I can find some help and uh, also where else should I look for help. Uh, please note the session doesn't cover the supply of goods. The reverse charge has nothing to do with goods really except in specialist circumstances which we're not going to cover today which are broadly to do with high value uh, items like mobile phones. Uh, if you are looking into goods chances are you need something on import VAT and uh, acquisitions, uh, which is completely different to reverse charge, although it can at a high level seem similar. Uh, business to consumer supplies, we don't cover that at all um, because who cares? Uh, no, I'm joking, <laughs> because the reverse charge doesn't apply to that, it never really happens. And uh, finally, we're not going to cover scenarios where services are paid for by one party but consumed by another, except uh, under electrically supplied goods. We'll come on to that later. Uh, just before we start, a few VAT terms which are used uh, in the presentation. Uh, it's not going to be very technical, but these are kind of used pretty much all the time by anyone who works in VAT. Uh, and I'm sure you already know them, <coughs> but I just want to put them down just in case. Uh, so when I refer to a supply, a supply is simply something that we use in VAT for, uh, for another word for where a business sells goods or services. A anything done for consideration can be a supply. Uh, just something to note here, the reverse charge only applies to services, um, so it's a supply of services which may incur the reverse charge. <coughs> uh, acquisition VAT applies to goods which are imported uh, and it's not to do with the reverse charge, so if you're looking to do with acquisition VAT, you may as well end this presentation now. Uh, other thing we use here is VAT exempt. Uh, exempt refers to services which are exempt from VAT. Uh, this, please note that this is different to services which are zero rated. So what I'm talking about here are things like insurance services, banking services, which the invoice just says £100. Uh, if it's insurance, it would say £100 plus IPT. That's not VAT. It's exempt from VAT. Uh, however, you can get certain services, sometimes, for example, food, which I know is a good, but that's zero rated. It is a taxable supply when it's zero rated, but it's just the tax rate is at zero percent. It's really important that you get that distinction clear, that exempt and zero rated, while <coughs> for practical purposes, for the customer, they look the same, they're not. One is exempt of VAT and the other one is zero rated, has a tax rate of zero percent. Uh, finally, taxable. 
Uh, this basically means, as I was just saying, uh, that a service has a tax rate applied to it. The tax rates in the UK are 0%, 5% or 20%. <coughs> Again, there's that really hammering home that point about 0% to make clear that it is a different to an exempt service. Right, it's a bit early in the presentation, but I'm going to launch straight into what are the actual accounting entries. Um, I'm not expecting any of you guys to be able to put these into context, but I kind of want to put a load of foundational ideas out there, and then hopefully through the presentation, you'll be able to come back to those ideas and go, okay, now I understand what he's talking about, and now I understand what they say when they say debit and credit, uh, sales and purchases, to get the reverse charge. <coughs> so here's the uh, double entry. Uh, and if you can see the uh, top top double entry debit expense 100 pounds credit accounts payable 100 pounds uh, being for the recognition of the expense item that's like any other in invoice it would be posted directly off AP going to you know maybe it's a prepayment but you know whatever it goes straight to the PL in this case uh, that's a really straightforward journal everybody understands it <coughs> now the one beneath it is the actual VAT reverse charge now as you can see it's 20 pounds why is it 20 pounds that's because it's 20 percent of 100 pounds so uh, you know you got that right, <laughs> that's a good start. But what's happening here? Debit, VAT receivable, credit, VAT payable. So what am I doing there? Well, I'm saying I'm creating a VAT asset of 20 pounds, and at the same time, I'm putting the other side to a VAT liability of 20 pounds. The two net off together. That's all that happens. And that's the ver reverse charge. Now, you, some people might send that directly to the P&L. They might do v debit, VAT expense, credit, <coughs> VAT expense at the same time. I've just put it both to the balance sheet. It doesn't really matter uh, because it's a accounting issue. No cash has been here, moved here. In respect of this, this you've just made this journal up. This debit, VAT receivable, credit, VAT payable. Yep. So when you come to pay your expense, <coughs> what you'll do is you'll unwind the original transaction by doing debit, AP, credit, bank. That clears off the accounts payable, your supplier, <coughs> your supplier liability. And obviously, you don't actually need to unwind anything on the VAT reverse charge journal because, as I said, it debits and credits itself out. Uh, just again, to really hammer this home, the £20 VAT is not on the invoice. You create it yourself. It's an accounting journal. You're never going to see that £20 on the face of an invoice. If you do, then your supplier is doing something wrong. <coughs> uh, so that's really the accounting the accounting for it that's what they mean debit that receivable credit that payable it nets itself out in most bu in fully taxable businesses hey, Liam. this slide deals with the place of supply rules uh, to be honest I always make a hash of explaining these but it's really really straightforward uh, basically the transaction is determined where the customer is established I know that sounds or might sound a little bit convoluted but hopefully I'll explain it over this slide and I won't turn it into a complete mess, which is what I often do. <laughs> so on the left hand side you have a UK business selling to a UK business. Uh, it's charging UK VAT, both businesses are established in the UK, that is the majority of transactions for UK businesses. Uh, company 1 raises an invoice for £100 plus VAT, it has to because they're both VAT registered. Now the scenario on the right is a French business selling to a UK business. Uh, and it doesn't charge UK VAT, uh, and it doesn't charge French VAT. Now, obviously, if a business was smart, it would just go and buy everything from a French business because there's no VAT on it. And that, therein, is why we do the reverse charge. Because a smart business, if it didn't have to do the reverse charge, would go and buy everything from overseas and save the VAT. So what we do is we have the reverse charge, but who does it? Well, th well, this is what the place of supply rules are determining. Who does the reverse charge? Who self-accounts for the VAT to equalise the tax? Well, the rule states is that it is where the customer is established. So, in our example, the business on the right, uh, the, the companies on the right, you have a French business selling advertising services to the UK. It doesn't charge French fat because it doesn't have to because it's an international service, cross-border service. Instead, what you'll see on their invoices, it will say something in French saying, subject to the reverse charge or words to that effect. The UK business though, when it sees that invoice, it goes, oh, that's from an overseas supplier. It then thinks, where does the 
where does the transaction take? Will I am the, take place? Will I am the recipient of that service? So the, I know that the transaction has to take place in the UK. What are my requirements under VAT law? Well, I must charge, well, the invoice even says subject to the reverse charge. So what do I do? I then go and debit and credit my, my VAT accounts to create that reverse charge. So just to put it into context, you can see what it's doing there. It is equalizing tax. So the company now on the right hand side, the UK company on the right hand side buying services from France, well, assuming that those original services were exactly the same in cost between the French supplier and the UK supplier, they have now been equalized. There is no tax saving, there is no cash saving buying from France. And that's the purpose of the reverse charge. That's why we do it, and that's why we have to do it. So this slide shows what I refer to as the reverse charge workflow. It's going to be different for every business, but broadly this kind of captures everything that you're going to have to need to think about if you haven't turned it into a process uh, in respect to the reverse charge when you receive an invoice. Um, what I've kind of done from a high level piece on this slide is kind of split what I consider are process steps and what are or could be kind of uh, steps where you might need to apply some judgment or you might need to use some technical logic knowledge. The important thing to note here though is that the reverse charge should be a process and that everything on this slide should really be blue apart from filing your VAT return and reviews attached to that. It's not, a, it's not a complex thing and your accounting system when you set it up correctly will be able to turn this into a flow all the way from AP all the way to your VAT return but I guess it's to get it set up correctly you've got to understand it. Um, so what we're going to do in the next few slides is work through each of these steps. We're going to go into a little bit more depth uh, and hopefully by the end of it, you guys are like, oh, perfect. Don't know what I ever worried about. Hi guys, it's the uh, place of supply. Again, so you get an invoice or AP picks up an invoice and they need to know, what do I do with this? Does the reverse charge apply? Or should this have French VAT on it? Now, the first thing that you remember for services is that the place of supply is where the customer is established. So you need to ask yourself, Who's the customer? Well, I'm the customer because I'm, I'm receiving the invoice. I'm getting charged for this. Where am I established? Well, I'm established in London. Why is this French supplier put French VAT on it? No, 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 no. So you go back to your AP and you tell them, call this French supplier and say, we're VAT registered. You shouldn't be charging French VAT. And thus, they don't charge French VAT and you have to do the reverse charge. Now, for a lot of businesses, that can all be automated. Um, and it, it's normally all automated when you set up a supplier. So you set up a French supplier, you move it into, you can click a button, I know you can do it in Zero, you can do it in Sage, uh, which says subject to reverse charge or something like that. And that means that your AP doesn't have to worry about it. And that's what I was talking about when I was saying that you can turn some judgment steps into process steps. Because you are immediately saying on setup, of your supplier that this is a French supplier that means that when he charges me for services and I know he's only ever going to charge me for marketing services I'm always going to be the customer uh, and where am I established in the UK which means that the invoices have to be subject to the reverse charge you subject to UK VAT under the reverse charge mechanism so that's the place of supply and obviously just on the bottom of the slide uh, I don't need to re go over it again and again, but the purpose of it is to prevent a French bridge discharging French VAT as it, uh, to a UK business. It's to prevent distortions in the tax system. That shouldn't be happening. This is just another example for the place of supply. Uh, I'm not going to go through this slide because I think I've done it to death, uh, but you guys can read through it in your own time and kind of work through, uh, work through it. But remember, the general rule, a place, the place of supply is where the customer is established. Who's the customer? I am in the UK. That's where it needs to be taxed. It needs to be subject to UK VAT and only UK VAT. But as I say, read through the example. Any questions, I'm happy to help. Hi guys, so uh, obviously I've been banging on about the general rule that the place of supply is where the customer is established. That is a general rule, but there are, uh, but there are some exemptions to it. Uh, and these are the exceptions to those general rules. And it's probably worthwhile if you think you are in a case where you might be reaching an, an exception C pick up your phone and call your CRM call at HMRC that, that's exactly what they're there to do and, and help you out with um, broadly though it's uh, cultural artistic sporting scientific entertainment services and ancillary services to these so for example you might be putting on some kind of cultural uh, cultural show in Spain 
uh, you advertise it in the UK, uh, it's to your UK customers in the UK, but it's put, but it's actually happening in Spain. Or maybe there's got some local VAT uh, consequences there. Uh, freight transport, again, you know, similar thing. You're, you're uh, hiring a vehicle from France to Germany from a company in the UK. So there's activity going on outside of the UK, uh, even though your uh, supplier is based in the UK. Kind of another thing is uh, means of transport, passenger transport, again, like that. And also uh, restaurant or catering services. So where you might be putting on a conference or something abroad uh, and you've paid a UK company to feed everyone at that conference, which is happening in Spain or uh, Portugal or Italy, if you're lucky. Uh, probably for me, it would be uh, Ireland, uh, although there's nothing wrong with Ireland. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you pay this UK company uh, and they charge you it. Where's the place to apply? Well, there might be some Irish uh, Irish tax consequences. And finally, a service related to the land. Now, obviously, these are all ex exceptions. Now, there's just something which I think maybe is worth pulling out of this, is that these exceptions are where things are physically happening on the whole in the underlying territory. So, you know, if you think uh, when, a, when a French business provides marketing services to the UK, yeah, like they're doing French activity, but it's a UK, but they're not kind of running around, you know, they're not physically moving tables and chairs or, or there's not, you know, it's kind of an ethereal kind of service they're providing. With these ones, it always the way I think about it is that there's something physically going on on the ground here. I, I am actually moving freight from France to Germany, for example. Uh, I, I am hiring transport in in Berlin. You know, I am putting on a conference in Germany and feeding loads of people. So there's there's kind of something something more going on there. I think than uh, than with the general services, and that's really I think what the except exceptions are trying to kind of point out that there's a, a greater degree of activity on a local basis, and hence perhaps there should be some exceptions there. But as I say, they're pretty rare to come across them. The, uh, most businesses, they ever see them, I would have thought really only to do with it with services relating to land and property. There, it's really obvious why the service is applied in France. You know, if the property's in France, it's very difficult to say that it shouldn't be, and it's very easy to understand why local tax should apply there. So they're the exceptions. As I say, again, these are the perfect things to call your CRM on or your HMRC officer for. That's what they're there for. Uh, you know, they'll be able to help you out. Um, so use them. Hi guys. Yeah, the uh, only other kind of exception exception to the place of supply rules, which I think is probably worth highlighting, relates to uh, telecommunication services, which are defined as services relating to transmission, emission, or reception of signals, writing, images, sound, or information of any nature by wire, radio, or other electromagnetic systems. So pretty long-winded, but I imagine basically anything that's passed through a signal or something like that. Now, uh, what is the uh, exception? It's called the use and enjoyment exception, which basically means that you have to account for VAT where those services are used, used and enjoyed, not necessarily where the customer is established. Now, I'm not really going to get into it because it, is, it doesn't actually often come up that often. Um, but I've got a more detailed example on the slide, which you guys can read through. The core thing to remember, I always think with use and enjoyment, though, is that for the rules to apply, you have to have a three-part arrangement. What do I mean by that? You have to have your supplier supplying you electro electronically supplied services. You have to be somewhere. You have to be established, say, in the UK. And you also have to have another leg somewhere which might attach itself to those services outside of the UK, for example, in France. So let's quickly run that over again. You have a German supplier who's supplying electronically supplied services. You're established in France, but you might have, for example, servers. No, you're established in the UK, but you might have servers in France. So German supplier, UK customer, that UK customer owns serv servers in France, which may be receiving the services. That's the kind of three-part arrangement. There has to be three territories for use and enjoyment to apply. 99% of the time, for most of you guys listening, that's never going to be you. If it is, work through it, work the problem with HMRC, go get some advice. This is one of those things where it's probably worth getting some advice on it because it is esoteric. The rules are changing all the time. It doesn't happen very often. This is really, you know, I'm putting it in there for completeness. I'm not expecting really anyone listening to this to 
really actually see this and go, this thing's for me. But remember always, use and enjoyment can only apply if there's three territories involved. The territory of your supplier, where you are, and somewhere else where you own something which could be considered to be re receiving those services. Uh, here's an example on the use and enjoyment rules. Uh, I really advise skipping over it unless you think, oh, this definitely applies to me. It's pretty technical. You're not going to really ever need to know it in your day to day. And if it does pop up, go get some advice, go talk to HMRC. This is a rarity. I've only put it in there for completeness.